bear with me in my folly. Gathered around the throne of God one day are the saints from every age. Billions, millions, all bowing down at the throne of God in adoration and worship and praise. What a day that's going to be. Amen. I'm looking forward to it. Hope you'll be there. It's by appointment only. You have to have a divine appointment with Jesus first. And then there, there may be hope. Hallelujah. You know, I was uh, really praying this last week. In fact, usually I, my, my sermon planning usually goes in three, four, six months, sometimes even up to a year in advance as I'm laying out the sermons. And as I was working on the Christmas season back in the spring, looking at everything I was going to preach, I, I had laid out even last Sunday's sermon, you know, about the fighting family festivities and putting the holy back in the holidays. And I lined out some other sermons as we get into this Christmas season having to do with the holidays and the holy days of the virgin birth and another passage I'm preaching until Shiloh comes, be preaching on that and, and the, the incarnation, why God becomes a man uh, on our behalf. Uh, but uh, I, I was going to preach one of those this Sunday, but I just couldn't get away after last Sunday message of just lingering there just a little longer. Uh, in dealing with some of the things that we talked about last Sunday, and uh, especially in regard to what we talked about uh, Christmas, in regard to what it's really all about, as I began to prepare the messages and, and uh, look at specifically this one thing that we did talk about was, was forgiveness last week. And when you start thinking about forgiveness, the more I dealt with it, this really is the heart of Christmas or what the Christmas season is really all about. When you really think about from a biblical and a purely theological point of view, uh, even the angels announced, it says, and you shall bring forth a son and they shall call him, his name, Jesus. And catch this, for he shall save his people from their sins. Obviously the name means Yeshua, Savior, salvation. But the idea here, the whole essence of what the angel is saying, he will bring forgiveness over their sins. He will, he will, he will bring forgiveness into their lives. In fact, John went later on to write in 1 John, well, that's not going to work by click, so you're going to get to do it for me today. In 1 John uh, 2, 2, it says, and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's all about forgiveness. And John went on to say the message is a message of forgiveness. It's a message of restoration and a message of reconciliation. When you go into Ephesians chapter four, it translates into our life. Now that we are forgiven, he says instead, and we shared this verse last week, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God through Christ has forgiven you. So in other words, as we've been given this gift of forgiveness that we celebrate even at Christmas through the, the very presence of the Lord Jesus Christ as he comes and gives us forgiveness, he says, now you extend that forgiveness beyond yourself being forgiven and you now are not just the forgiven, you're the forgivers. And now we have this, this new relationship which is based on our relationship to, to our Father through Jesus on the precious blood and the forgiveness of our sins. And now he goes on to say that we, we demonstrate the same thing. In Matthew 18, 35 says, so shall my heavenly father also do to you if you forgive from your heart. If you do not forgive from your, his brother's trespasses. He's talking about that parable in Matthew 18 that deals with forgiveness. In Matthew 18, you remember it's the story of the man who owes the king a great debt. The king is, brings him in to collect the debt he can't pay it. There's no way possible to pay this great debt off. And so the king, the king in that moment of kindness and mercy and love forgives this man, this servant of the great debt that he owes the king. The accounts are settled. The king's accountant is there. Everybody's there of importance. I mean, the bill's been drawn out. It's time to pay the bill. And now the king marks upon the bill. The account writes something like Telestai, paid for. It's sealed with the king's seal. In fact, in formality, a copy would be given. The, the transgressor would be given the one who's been offended and a copy retained by the king's accounting records of his own. So in case it was brought back up, we have the forgiveness paid. That whole issue about forgiveness that Jesus shared was on the basis of, hey, don't be someone who's been forgiven what you cannot repay and then try to go out and not forgive somebody of the little bit that they've done to you. Because in regard to what we've been forgiven and then in what we're called to forgive others, it is a small issue. Now, looking back over it, just not being able to really escape this whole thing. It was, I mean, verse after verse in the New Testament, 
makes it supremely clear that when you get into the Christmas season, that it is the message of restoration. The message of Christmas, the message of the cross, the message of Christ is restoration and reconciliation, bringing opposing parties together. Forgiveness is all about the cross. It's really all about Christmas. I mean, we really look at, at the heart of what's going on there. But so many people have such an issue with this one thing. In fact, there's a lot of popular ideas out today about forgiveness that aren't biblically even true. I know I, I counsel and have known people that I've dealt with in counseling situations over the years who, who are strapped with all kinds of difficulties and problems in their life. Sometimes it's obsessions with things or clothing or sometimes it's addictions and drunkenness all because there's some issue when you look back into their past where this was not dealt with. Something was not forgiven. It might've been something horrendous and something horrible, but it, it's just not forgiving. I know of marriages that have fallen apart simply because when hurtful circumstances came up, they refused to forgive. R remember what Jesus said when they asked him about divorce? He said, the writ of divorce was given because of the hardness of your hearts. You won't be tender hearted. You won't be kind. You won't be forgiving. And when that happens, he says, then all kinds of other issues begin to arrive. We have to deal with this, this issue of forgiveness. And I, and I felt like it was important today to deal with it a little bit more than what we have done already. It's not just some kind of a mind game. It's not going through some kind of mental gymnastics. There really is a way biblically to wash our souls of the hurt or the pain perhaps that we've experienced from somebody else and how it's affected us. There's a way to have cleansing and deliverance. In fact, when you look at the parable of Matthew 18, there's, there's two sides in that uh, of forgiveness that are dealt with. First is the practical side, and I'll talk to you that, about that in just a moment. And then there's the personal side. How does forgiveness affect me as an individual and even the one that I am forgiving? The manner Jesus said in Matthew 18, he says, in which you forgive others, he says, so my heavenly father will also do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother of his trespasses. The manner in which I forgive others is ultimately, the Lord says, it has a lot to do with the way we're relating to one another. I have forgiven you. If you want to experience the fullness of that in your life, and so many people don't, if you really want to experience the fullness of forgiveness in your life, then you learn to forgive others. So the practical side, let, let's look at that. Just what is forgiveness? Even as used in, this, in the parable of, of the sower and the sea, I mean, sower and sea, of the, of the, the steward and the king and, and the forgiveness of the debt. Forgiveness is a word which literally means to send someone away or to go away yourself, leaving all claims behind. I don't expect anything else out of you. You don't expect anything else out of me in this regard. It is not basically an action of emotions. It's an action of the will. It is a deliberate volitional decision by you, which you say this person is no longer in debt to me. I am no longer in debt to them. I choose to hold no more claims against this person and for what they've done in regard to me. This issue is dealt with. It's paid in full. I'm not relating to this person on the basis of offenses anymore. I'm not relating to this person on the basis of my hurt feelings anymore. I'm not going to relate to this person on the basis of my personal loss anymore. Here's the point. We forgive and that settles the issue. Too often when we, we say we forgive, but yet on some future occasion, we want to bring that person back into the, like, like this steward dealt with, the, the servant, the king. We want to bring people back into the courtroom of our, our opinion or the back in the courtroom of our emotion and demand some kind of payment. You're saying now there's not going to be any future expectations of payment because somehow we feel because they have hurt us that they owe us or they're obligated to us. And we'll see in a moment how that even goes into us being obligated to do something to them. But Basically, the bottom line with forgiveness says, I am not pursuing this any further. It may be brought up in my mind. It may be dealt with my emotions, but hey, I'm not going to pursue it. I'm not going to drag it out. I'm not going to relive it. I'm not going to re replay it in some negative way. I relinquish all claims against this, per against this person or this circumstance and the decision has been made. I'm not going back on the decision I've forgiven because you'll be tempted to. 
Forgiveness needs to be distinguished from a few other practices that are associated with it. And I remember I dealt with this little portion in a, in a marriage retreat one time when we talked about forgiveness. It doesn't mean, first of all, that, uh, uh, that I approve somebody else's actions because that's the last thing forgiveness means. And a lot of people think, well, if I forgive, then that means I just accept what they did or I approve what they did. And what they did was horrible and what they did was terrible. And you know, it was mean spirited. And I, I, I just, it was perverted even. But it doesn't approve of someone's offenses any more than when God forgave you of your sins that he approved of your disobedience or he approved of your rebellion. Also understand forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation or restitution. Now, it can be the platform which leads the way. It's wonderful when those things happen, but forgiveness is first steps, all right? Uh, it, it means that I'm going to, to deal with it in, in, in this arena of my will and my, my decision at this point in time. Uh, because it, it may be, the, in fact, the person you're forgiving, not even alive. You can't make restitution or reconciliation and you can't go to them. So it doesn't in necessarily include reconciliation or restitution. And I believe there in the, it can be independent issues and which probably need to be dealt with when the occasion happens or when, it, when, when there's opportunity for it. But also let me say this, forgiveness is not forgetting. All right, people who say, well, I have to forget before I can forgive, they'll never forgive because the mind is a unique thing, amen? The mind, it, it, it's, it's like that digital data recorder that just writes down everything and always remembers the wrong things and can't remember things. And where to put my keys, you know? <laughs> the incidental things that somebody just releases, but the issues and the big things. And obviously when I'm hurt, that's a big thing when, you, when you've been offended. Now the Bible says, yes, God will remember our sins no more. But remember God's omniscient, right? That means that God's not gonna bring them up against me anymore. He's cast them into that file called the deep seas of God's forgetfulness. They're filed away, it's dealt with. He's not going to bring them. I, when I stand before God one day to receive entrance into the eternal glory, he's not gonna stop and say, oh, by the way, you, you, you know, we need to deal with some stuff here. <laughs> it's all been dealt with. It's under the blood of Jesus, my sins are forgiven. I don't always forget. But what it does mean that when I do remember it, I will not remember it in the context of something owed anymore. It's something that has been forgiven. It's something that's been stamped and sealed with my signature that says, hey, uh, the choice has been made. It, this crisis of will has been done and it is forgiven. I will not bring something up against this person or this situation. Now I know, honestly, because I'm human as you are, it's somehow when we're offended, seems to pull against the, the concept of justice that we have, all right? Something needs to be said. Something ought to be done. Some response. Romans 12 says in verse 19, dearly beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place. Don't give place unto wrath. It's written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Forgiveness says, I'm gonna let God handle this. And here's the good thing about it. God knows how to handle it. And we ought to be, grateful to God that we let him handle us in our case because he handled it in mercy and he handled it in grace. It was costly and it does cost. I mentioned last week, some, it cost us when, when we pay the price, we pay a certain price when we forgive evil that's been done against us because we're, we're sacrificing that emotion. We're sacrificing those pains that we've even experienced ourselves. That, that's on the practical side. The personal side, in fact, there's, there's three positive results that result from this. Well, and we'll deal with each one of these qu quickly. But one is freedom, another is faith, and another is fellowship. When I choose to say forgiveness comes at this point, what's going on here? And these are the three positive aspects. W one is freedom, all right? And that comes on, on two levels, freedom from debt and, and freedom from torment. First of all, is freedom from debt. Freedom from debt for us, but also freedom from debt for the offender, all right? I, I, I can't come into this and say, hey, uh, I, I'm not going to forgive because this person, you know, I owe this guy something. No, you don't. Uh, well, what are you? Well, I owe him a lecture. <laughs> I owe him a cold shoulder. I owe him to talk about him like he talked about me. I owe him perhaps just criticism or rudeness or whatever it might be. Something needs to be said. Something needs to be done. I just feel impelled. I have that debt to pay. I don't have the debt. To, I'm free from that now. 
I don't have to feel like I've got to react in any way. I don't have to respond in any way. No longer can that person say even of me. I mean, because it frees them when true forgiveness comes. They can't say, well, my life would be different, but he will not forgive me because I'm forgiving now. So the debts are cleared up. So remember, when we refuse to forgive someone, we're retaining that person's case in our own little courtroom like something has to be settled on it. The Bible says in Romans 13, as believers, owe no man anything but love. You say, well, he might deserve it. That, that's not the issue here. We, we, we're forgiving. And I said, it's also freedom of debt for, for the offender. When God forgave us and forgave you and me, what did he do? He set me free from the coming judgment. He set me free from condemnation. So what am I now doing when I forgive you? You forgive me. We're setting the other person free. It, there's this act of forgiveness. And, 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 and even in the story of the parable with the king and the servant, when the king brought him in and forgave him, you know what the king was doing? The king was saying, I'm not going to re regard you any longer as somebody that owes me something. Or I owe something too. Judgment. This ground's equal now. This ground's settled now. This ground's right now. We're, we're going we're to resolve this issue here and now, and you're forgiven. And you say, well, that's good for them, but my situation's a little more difficult than that. No, it isn't. It's, it, it, there's this freedom that has to flow. Uh, now that when the servant comes to the king, there's enjoyed fellowship. He just has a harder lesson to learn in the process, which he doesn't learn so easy. Excuse, go back to that one more. So there's freedom from debt and there's freedom from torment was the third thing on that page. Remember, when the guy doesn't forgive, he brought in a torment. Proverbs 17 tells us in verse 22, a broken spirit dries the bones. It dries the bones. There's just something about unforgiveness that, that affects us emotionally, mentally, physically, on every level. The Bible says it will spoil many a root of bitterness will. Not only just you, it begins to affect other, or infect other people through your life. Bitterness causes a lot of suffering in people's hearts and life. But listen, when grace is exercised, you're gonna operate in the grace of God and extend grace. When, because God's given you grace. When you extend that grace, forgiveness begins to flourish and freedom begins to come. Second Timothy chapter two says, be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be strong in this area of your life. Be the person who learns to express grace and to give grace and to show grace and mercy. So what's the practice of that? First of all is freedom. The second thing we experience is, is faith. I mean, what's one of the great results of forgiveness is that it really does help us rely on the Lord because we cannot in our own flesh, nor do we want to, nor will we. But when we trust the Lord, guess what's happening here? We're beginning to walk in faith. When we forgive, we're saying, my God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So when I'm giving forgiveness, guess what? I'm receiving grace. If I'm giving grace, I'm receiving grace. And God has given me what I need. And it's the same thing in your heart and in your life. As you choose to trust the Lord and believe God, he'll give you what you need. So forgiveness really does, if we're honest about it and being genuine with it, it runs us to our Father. It runs us to trust. It runs us to believe and say, God, you know, I need this forgiving spirit. And I cannot have that unless I, I rely on the resources of your grace. I cannot do this if I don't rely on the, on the presence of your Holy Spirit in my life. I choose to forgive. We can't forgive people. If we're feeling like they owe us something, we're going to let all that go. We're saying, you know, if they owe me something, that offending person now holds the key to my joy. I can't have joy if they don't do what I want them to. If they don't cry, if they don't humble themselves, if they don't come back and say they're sorry, if they don't seek restitution, then I'm just never going to be happy. That's a pitiful place to be. Is it not? My joy, my grace comes from the Lord. By forgiving this individual, whoever it might be, or individuals, I'm relinquishing any hold I have on them as well as any hold they may have on me. And that's the kind of faith that pleases the Lord because what I'm saying, my hold is on him. I'm trusting the Lord. The third element of, of this was fellowship. And this is on put, two important levels. First of all is fellowship with my father. Because forgiving does more than just open the door for restored relationship with others. It helps me to restore my relationship with my heavenly father. It's, God says, you know, how can you expect me to forgive you or for you to experience the freedom of forgiveness if you're not going to forgive other people? So when forgiveness comes, here comes restoration. Here comes fellowship. I mean, in the parable, Jesus emphatically is telling those people listening to the parable, hey, you know, 
you're going to have fellowship with your father and enjoy the grace of your father when you learn to forgive others. I mean, he's nailing that down. You, you can experience fullness when you express and give freedom and forgiveness to other people. Simply when I choose to forgive or when you choose to forgive at this point, uh, we're just applying the grace of God, not only to our life, but to, uh, to human lives in general. But it restores us not only to fellowship with the Father, but also to usefulness or to ministry, if you want to put it that way. God is saying, and I believe in Matthew 18 parable, you're really not functional. You might as well be in prison. You're not usable. Ministry's not going to happen in your life as long as you're not expressing everything that I gave my life for. Forgiveness. Their theology, you know, if, if you chase, if you move against that, you know, you're basically saying, just put me on the shelf because I, I can't be like you. I won't be like you. I refuse to be like you. In this situation, and all too often I say, well, Brother Joe, my situation is different. It's just different. It's just, you know, it's unique. The Bible says there's no temptation taking you, but such as common, it is common to man. In other words, everybody deals with it. Everybody's hurt. Everybody's rejected. Everybody's been made promises that weren't been, haven't been kept. Everybody's been offended on some level, some greater than others, some less than others, but everybody experiences those things. And God gives grace for every part of it. And if I want to experience usefulness in my Christian walk in life, I got to get out of my self-imposed prison and forgive and move forward with God and let him do something through my life. Now, I've noticed in recent months and even in years, the popularity of the concept of forgiveness, even in secular circles. I mean, all you have to do is watch Dr. Phil for a little bit or some of these other talk shows. So not only has it kind of become a mantra in, in Christianity in the church, which it needs to be, but also in, in American secularism, there's this idea of, of let's forgive. It's become the, the latest tool, not just for believers, but for non-believers even, to overcome a painful past and difficult relationships and problems in their life. And through this act of forgiveness, according to secularism, is that you could achieve personal peace and happiness and success. It's a widespread view of, of forgiveness that's out there. It, it's therapeutic forgiveness is the way, the way I put it. You experience this therapeutic forgiveness and it'll effectively, you know, uh, help you through the process. In fact, there's about five or six, there's six myths. Two of them at the end I, I want to share with you are really close related. And it, it, these are six real simple things. But as I give you the myth, I want to give you the biblical fact because perhaps you bought into the myth of forgiveness. You hadn't understood the biblical principle of forgiveness. Because what's being, you know, spouted out and propagated in the secular media and all the popular talk shows isn't necessary uh, what we would call a biblical forgiveness. God's forgiveness is unique. First of all, myth number one is this. Forgiveness is a gift you give yourself. All right. That's a popular thing. In fact, there was a mega church pastor on this morning a few weeks ago who had the, there was a parade of Christian and secular writers. They were they've been speaking out on forgiveness and they were talking to some of these people. In fact, there was this person, Dr. Fred Luskin. He's the founder and the director of the Stanford Forgiveness Projects. Doesn't that sound good? And here's what he states right outright as the director of the Forgiveness Project. Forgiveness is for you and not for anyone else. But the Bible teaches differently about forgiveness. Well, you've got to go back and hit the fact for me. The Bible says this, forgiveness is a gift to the offender. Yes. Yes. You benefit from it, but it's your gift to the offender. You're releasing the other person, you know, from the debts for their sake. And obviously, you're obviously doing it for Christ's sake. It enables you to care about the good of the person that's offended you rather than just looking out for yourself. Forgiveness myth number two is forgiveness, they say, is about letting go of the past. This is secularized forgiveness. It emphasizes self-empowerment, uh, letting go. That's the big thing. Just let go, you know. Focus is mostly uh, on your future and you want to give, you know, a little attention to the past, but that's in the past and, and you want to deal with it. Here's the biblical fact. God redeems and heals the past rather than erases it. 
This is where we learn as Christians. This is how we grow as Christians. We learn how to relate those situations in our life to, to the grace of God, to the cross of Jesus, to the power of the Holy Spirit. God continually admonishes us to remember him, to remember the events of the past. In fact, there's these calls in Psalms to remember your past triumphs as well as your past victories, but always remember them in the light of God's grace, in the light of God's redemptive power. So we turn all those things over. Dr. Dan Allender wrote this. He said, every tragedy in your past is an opportunity for redemption. And each time we forget, we lose another moment to experience God's mysterious redemption in our life. So when I look back on the past, I look back with this God's redeeming power. Look what God did. But the myth is that you're just letting all that go. Let's erase it and let's go farther. The third forgiveness myth is this. Forgiveness is entirely your choice. Dr. Robert Enright wrote this, and he's one of the foremost authorities on forgiveness because he has a book called Forgiveness is a Choice. <laughs> so that makes him authority. You know, even in churches, we, we talk about forgiveness in the, this context of, of uh, it's, it's making a more appealing pitch by saying, you know, this is your choice. But the biblical truth about in regard to this is that forgiveness is required. All right. Forgiveness is required. In other words, when we say it's your choice to make, you need to be cautious in thinking that that means there's an alternative option that is just as good as the first and there's not. You understand what I'm saying? You forgive at least to freedom. If you don't forgive, it's bondage. So God tells us, Forgive others as you have been forgiven. We're commanded repeatedly by Jesus, forgive as we've been forgiven. So our forgiveness of others is really a natural outworking of God's forgiveness to us. That wasn't presented an option. God says, I'm ready to forgive. I'll forgive. Number four, forgiveness will lift you up and advance your career. And that's where a lot of purveyors of forgiveness promise success and advancement and achievements. One pastor writes in his new book on forgiveness, reading this book may be the most important step you can take right now towards professional advancement. If that's what it's really all about, listen to this. The fact is biblical forgiveness humbles the forgiver. The act of forgiving requires humility. The act of forgiveness fosters humility. That parable in Matthew 18 of the unmerciful servant makes it clear that whatever debt others owe us, we've been cleared of far greater debts by God. Amen. God's forgiven us of so much more than what I've been asked to forgive. The goal of forgiveness is not exaltation. The goal of forgiveness is not at personal and professional advancement. The goal of forgiveness is identification with and compassion for the guilty. And that's something that's so often lost. It's there go I, but for the grace of God. And I reach out with compassion at this point, even though they've done that to me. Myth number five is forgiveness frees you from the obligation to the offender. Dr. Phil urges his followers to forgive as a means of reaching emotional closure. We need to have some closure now, he advises us to find the easiest thing you can do to resolve your pain, you know. This is the easiest thing you can do because your pain needs to be resolved. And, you know, it's, 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 it's the way to, to be free from any obligation. Now, again, that's just something you have to look at carefully because biblical, biblical forgiveness frees you to love the offender, not to forget them, not to blow them off. Well, I did what I need to do. I'm done with them. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness frees us, but it frees us from our self-focus. It frees us from hate. It opens the door with empathy, but it frees us to love them. The things that were hindering me from really reaching out, from really having compassion, that is now gone. It frees and strengthens us to bring us close to the offender. This is what God did when he forgave me. Yes. It wasn't to forget me, to leave me in the past somewhere. I don't want to think about it anymore. It was to bring me into fellowship which is the sixth point, which is tied to extremely that it's primarily, they think, in the context of the secular world to make you happier and healthier. And there is an element to that truth, but biblical forgiveness, the fact is this, is concerned with the well-being of all people, particularly people who are guilty, particularly people who are needy. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's for Mar- yes, there's a, it is in, in some way, as we said, there is this freedom that we lose. I mean, this freedom that we gain from loosing them of the debt to us, but it goes to realizing that, hey, there's something God wants to do in their life. I've experienced forgiveness. I've experienced the grace and the forgiveness of God. Now I can be concerned with the issue of forgiveness in somebody else's life who's hurting or who's in bondage, whose life's messed up. They act the way they act because they are the way they are. Praise God, I acted the way I act because I was the way I was, but God showed me mercy and grace and changed my life. Forgiveness, big word. But it's a territory that we need to claim and hold and dwell on. You know, the Bible says don't miss the grace of God. In fact, I believe that forgiveness is really the key to coping with anger. Anger in marriage. Why do we get so mad? We let well, stuff boil up and boil up. We don't forgive it. We don't. We hold on to it. And all of a sudden it just explodes. We say, but Joe, he broke his promise or she broke her promise. Or, My boss, he didn't keep his word. Let me ask you the simple question. And this is the way that the Lord's kind of helped me deal with some of these things is. How did God react towards Joe Arms when I broke my promises to him? How did God treat me when I didn't do what I told him I would do it? I think it helps us to realize that, you know, he says forgiven. And I think that's the whole key of the verse. You forgive others as you have been forgiven. I need to recall the as part how I was forgiven. I've been lied to. I lie to the Lord. I've been hurt. I, 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 it, it, it comes back to say, Lord, I, I, have I ever neglected you? Well, yes. Have I always been attentive to your will? No. None of us have. How did he react though? How did he react when he was neglected? He continued to show mercy and to love. I'll close with this little point here. How do you forgive from the heart? Of course, Ephesians 4 says, be angry and sin, not let the, not the sun go down upon your wrath. But first of all, I think, first of all, you do acknowledge the, the hurt. You know, you acknowledge the pain, the hate, whatever was there. Don't be afraid. It's not going to bite you. All right, it's already been biting you. <laughs> that was real, that hurt. Second of all, don't wait to it. Do you feel like something? Forgive now. Healing comes. God brings grace, and with the grace comes God's healing hand. Most importantly, number three, you take it to the Father, you leave it with the Father, you work on it with the Father, you trust the Father. It all revolves around your relationship to loving Him and letting Him love through you. There was an illustration I think I shared a couple years ago at one of our marriage retreats about a father. And it's a a story that took place in Spain about a father, a Spanish father who who, uh, had a bad relationship with his son and they'd become estranged and been away for a long time. The son ran away. Uh, The father, after some time, began to feel remorse and began to to look for him. He couldn't find him anywhere. I mean, he searched for months to no avail to find his son. And he said, well, let me just try this. In the last desperate effort, the father put an ad in in the paper in Madrid, Spain. And the ad read, Dear Paco, meet me in front of the newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. On Saturday, 800 Pacos showed up. 800 looking for forgiveness from their father. 800. How many Pacos in our families, people we love and relationships, looking for an answer, looking for something, looking for acceptance, looking for love? You can be the one to give it. We talk about forgiveness in the heart of Christmas. Hey, it's a package I've opened, but it's a package I have to keep giving. The gift of God's forgiveness and the gift of God's grace and the gift of God's mercy. Make sure that it's wrapped up beautifully this this Christmas and given to everybody who's ever offended you or hurt you on any level. If you can't reach them, then you do it within your heart. You do it within your mind. You do it within your spirit. It's the gift that has to be opened, the gift of God's grace. It's the one gift that not only has to be opened, it's the one gift that has to be shared. Forgiveness. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father, I thank you today.